Mr. Hoffman spills the beans on his burning desire to crack a 30-year-old nut, figuring out if Mr. Wolf, who might just have his eyes, is actually his son. Picture this, a blast from the past romance, a mysterious connection with Wolf's late mom, and here we are, decades later, with Mr. Hoffman clinging to the hope that DNA will play matchmaker. You can almost see the drama thickening as he pours out his heart, making everyone in the room reach for their tissues or popcorn. To solve a 30-year mystery and finally find out if Mr. Wolf is your long lost son. Yes, Your Honor. Now, you claim to have had a sexual relationship with his now deceased mother. Yes, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Wolf, you say you have no memories of Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, what the hell right? Then, bam, plot twist, Mr. Hoffman stumbles upon a potential blockbuster revelation on Facebook of all places, realizing he might be Mr. Wolf's dad. Talk about a modern-day saga. As he shares this jaw-dropper, the court turns into a scene straight out of a soap opera, showcasing how our digital lives can lead to real-world roller coasters. It's like CSI Family Edition, with the court hanging onto every word, witnessing how a simple friend request could unravel years of mystery. Only months ago, you received a message on social media stating that Mr. Hoffman believes he is your dad. So, Mr. Hoffman, explain to the court what happened 30 years ago. My older late sister had introduced me to Mr. Wolf's mother, but at the time, I was a over-the-road truck driver, so I was gone a lot. Wow, didn't see that coming. Flashback time, Mr. Hoffman reminisces about those golden days with young Mr. Wolf, when they shared laughs and crafted a bed with their bare hands. Talk about father-son bonding. This snippet from their past paints a picture of fleeting yet meaningful connections, injecting a dose of humanity into the court's proceedings. It's a reminder that sometimes the little things, like a wooden bed, can hold the biggest piece of our hearts. This twist takes us deeper into the Izzy the Dad drama. The lifestyle I lived almost without any emotion of not having a dad around. You just became guarded. And yet, there was a man all along that was looking for you. Last time I seen him, he had just turned five years old. Remember the good times? Mr. Hoffman and Mr. Wolf sure do. Cue the dramatic music. Mr. Hoffman recounts his near miss with a kidnapper label, all because he wanted to step up as dad of the year. Imagine the scene, there he was, trying to be the hero, only to get slapped with the bad guy tag. This plot twist adds some spicy drama to the mix, showing the courtroom that sometimes, the road to fatherhood is paved with legal landmines and gut-wrenching decisions. Oh. We got a call two months, a couple months later from my older sister. San Bernardino Sheriff's Department came to her home. They threatened me with a warrant for interstate flight and kidnapping of a minor. Really? They, I told him that no matter how long it takes, now grab your tissues because here comes a tearjerker, a heartfelt message from Auntie Hoffman to Mr. Wolf, bridging years of silence with words of love and longing. It's like finding an old love letter in a bottle, washing up on the shores of the courtroom. This sentimental telegram from the past highlights the unbreakable chains of family and the relentless hope of reconnection, giving everyone in the room a case of the warm fuzzies. My sister finally located him on Facebook. I actually had brought a copy of Jerome, it. Jerome, may I today. see that, please? Message, hi James, my name is Helen. I believe I'm your aunt. Your father has been looking for you for 25 years. You look just like our family. I don't know how much you know about your father. The tension peaks as the judge channels his inner Maury Povich, about to drop the DNA bombshell. You can cut the suspense with a knife as everyone leans in, awaiting the verdict that could either start a family reunion or turn into an episode of Missed Connections. It's the kind of moment that makes you wish you had popcorn as the courtroom braces for a revelation that could change everything. Then, the grand moment hits. Is Mr. Hoffman stepping into a new role, or is he just waiting to dash out the door as soon as the noise dies down? It proves that he is my son. I would like him, because we've talked over the phone before that if it proves positive that he is my son, I would want him legally to change his name, because he would... <laughs> I am the last Hoffman. Mr. Wolf, if in fact the results dictate that he is in fact your biological father, would you be amenable to changing your name to Hoffman? Absolutely, Your Honor. That Mr. Hoffman, you are his father. <laughs> <laughs> in a more gripping scene than a soap opera, Mr. Griffin lays his heart on the line, hoping against hope that he's Autumn's dad. His emotional roller coaster doesn't just tug at your heartstrings, it practically yanks them out, showing he's all in, blood ties or not. Okay. Mr. Griffin, you recently became engaged to the defendant. Yes, now, you Your say Honor. you desperately hope you are the child's biological father and confess you'll be heartbroken if today's results prove otherwise. 
Yes, Your Honor. Wow, wasn't that something? Miss Brown, in a moment of candid vulnerability, spills the beans about the paternity puzzle, admitting the timeline is as muddled as a plot in a detective novel. Her admission brings a twist that would make even a seasoned soap watcher raise an eyebrow, adding layers of intrigue and emotional drama. Mr. Griffin just showed how deep his love goes, proving you don't need blood ties to be a dad. Miss Brown, you admit you're unsure who fathered little Autumn. You confess you slept with two different men during the window of conception. The us, uh. You say there's a real chance Autumn may not be Mr. Grip. Shocking news next. Cue the dramatic music as Miss Brown recounts a scare that could chill any parent to the bone, with Autumn's health hanging by a thread. Meanwhile, Mr. Griffin turns into an action hero, walking a marathon's distance to reach his possibly not his daughter, proving his superhero dad status isn't contingent on DNA. Miss Brown's reveal adds a big twist, turning everything upside down. Um, well, Your Honor, he's been a great father. There was a time where um, Autumn was about three to four weeks old, and she stopped breathing on me. Um, I had to call the ambulance, and I knew that they would take so long to come, so I actually got in my car and I drove myself. On the way there, I called my ex, and I asked him, you know, to meet me at the hospital because my daughter wasn't breathing, and he said, no, I'm not coming, um, she's not my daughter. So I called him, and he said, I'm on my way. Not knowing at the time he didn't have a way to get there, he walked 25 miles, excuse me. Just when you think it can't get more complicated, Mr. Griffin stumbles upon a text that's more loaded than a Thanksgiving turkey, casting a long shadow of doubt over the already tangled paternity web and cranking up the tension in this familial Sega. Please explain that doubt. I came upon having a doubt. I caught something. I caught her on the phone. I seen the text message in the phone. And then she was on the phone with this guy. I thought they was done. And then I just grabbed my stuff and I left, kicked the door and left. So you think everything's normal. You see a text message, read the text message yes, from this guy, yes, so you just leave. Yes. Truth gets complicated. Miss Brown lays out the timeline with the precision of a courtroom exhibit, adding yet another layer of complexity to the who's the daddy drama and bearing her soul about the fear and uncertainty swirling around Autumn's lineage. And wait until you see this. I had unprotected sex with my ex. So um, maybe two weeks later, around January the 7th, um, me and Mr. Griffin had sex, but it was protected, but the condom, you know, popped. So at the time, I really didn't think that Mr. Griffin, you know, was her father. It was always in the back of my mind, Your Honor, but just thought that the ex was because we had unprotected sex. The season finale. Worthy climax hits as the DNA results are unveiled. Not just pulling at heartstrings, but playing them like a harp. And you think the two children, they really do look alike to you? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Griffin, you think Thank the you. two girls look alike? Yeah, they look like twins. Man, that's, that's, the, that's my babies right there. That's, that's daddy, baby girls. I do anything for them. I lay down my life for them. It has been determined by this court that Mr. Griffin is not the father. Mr. Hamilton, in a performance worthy of an Oscar, strides up to the judge, flamboyantly requesting a lie detector and a DNA kit for Ms. Lombardi's little princess, suspecting she's been playing a real-life game of Clue in the bedroom department. Ms. Lombardi, rolling her eyes so hard they could generate electricity, spills the tea that Mr. Hamilton has morphed into Sherlock Holmes, sneakily trying to pin the daddy title on himself for all the kiddos. Stay put, this video is about to fly. Mr. Hamilton, you have petitioned the court for a lie detector test on Ms. Lombardi, as well as DNA testing regarding her baby daughter. Yes, Your Honor. You're asking the court to administer these tests to help you prove it once and for all. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Lombardi, you argue that Mr. Hamilton is simply blinded by jealousy and paranoia. Yes, Your Honor. Wowza, that was a wild ride, transforming their living room into a daytime drama stage. Mr. Hamilton, feeling like he's auditioning for a detective role, outs Ms. Lombardi's clandestine meetups. This revelation turns their humble abode into a DIY forensic lab, prompting Ms. Lombardi to clap back with a zinger about Mr. Hamilton's jealousy being so thick it's practically a milkshake. The ensuing argument is so juicy it could fill a gossip magazine, especially with tales of a mysterious friend who moonlights as a potential dad after hours. Keep your socks on, we're starting this show. Hamilton are your fears that Miss Lombardi's cheating simply jealousy? So the other two, 
you know, it was like, wow, they go to the question right there. And with the baby in your question right and now, Yana. We, I have four kids with this man. Four kids. Three and a We should not have to be here for this one. And where the doubt stands in that with this fourth one. Look at yeah, my baby. Exactly. And she dog kidding every last kid. She looks got, just like you. With you a bald know head no. and she was a premium. It, this is Come tearing on, my family you apart, Your Honor. Hey, Your Honor. The courtroom feels more like a game show set, with baby Janae's complexion becoming the million dollar question. Mr. Hamilton is visibly flummoxed, trying to decode Janae's glow, which seems more beach vacay than family jeans. Meanwhile, Ms. Lombardi stands firm, insisting that Janai's peepers are a family heirloom, despite the color chart confusion. Look at her and you look at him. This baby's look father African. looks African. And she white, yes, but compared to my other children, my other so children. So she's a so little light. dark. So, so light. what? So light, Yana. There's no way this is my baby. So now, Ms. Lombardi, how does he treat Janae differently from the other he children? Will, he obvious. will not take care of her. He oh, will not oh, help me with her. Hey, I asked him to watch her. Lie, oh boy, that was a real circus. Amid the legal drama, Mr. Hamilton channels his inner soap star, getting misty-eyed and sentimental about his bond with Janae. Yet he's also scratching his noggin, wondering if he should start comparing baby pics or just embrace the mystery of parenthood. He is her father. As much as you are here and you are full of energy in terms of your story, this is hurting you because I can see the tears it in really your does. eyes. It this really is... does. You know what I mean? Because... Your Honor, this you know, has broken up our children, home after 12 years. You know I love my kids. I love them to death. I do anything for my children. I'm a great... So then why won't you take care of her? I, I do, Marie. And it's going to kill me inside because I deny it. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just... The judge, probably daydreaming about a peaceful retirement, hits the POWs button, calling for a science intervention to entangle this datum drama, hoping the DNA and lie detector results will be less convoluted than the plot of their lives. That's the, you know what that tells me? I'm right. You're not. You're All wrong. Right. Well, I'll tell you what. You've both taken lie detector tests. Before you read the results, I would like to say something to Mr. Hamilton. May well, I? Well, this would be the time. Yes. You were right. About what? I cheated with your what? friend. What? Oh, word? Really did that, man? Yes, twice. The night I came on, this yes, was outside. I really did. Man. Yes, I cheated, Your Honor. And it's his baby it's right here. It is a possibility. Just when you think it couldn't get more twisted, Ms. Lombardi drops a bombshell about a secret fling with Mr. Hamilton's golf buddy, adding a spicy subplot to the family saga. But let's hear those results. Hamilton versus Lombardi. It has been determined by this court, Mr. Hamilton. Yes, ma'am are her father. Oh my God, I knew it! I told you! I told you! I knew it! I knew it! I told you! The episode kicks off with more drama than a reality TV show marathon as Mr. Green spills the beans about his crushed dad dreams. Picture this, a grown man, nearly in tears, confessing his yearning to rock a baby to sleep. It's like watching a tough guy crumble at the sight of a puppy. This heartfelt moment not only tugs at the heartstrings, but also sets up a roller coaster of emotions, drawing viewers in like a magnet to the unfolding saga. Your eyes are gonna pop at the next bit. You claim your rights as a potential father to the child in question today, two-year-old Angel Bryant, were basically stolen from you. Yes, Your Honor. Wait, did our eyes just play tricks on us? Enter Ms. Duncan, stirring the pot with her bombshell admission that could outdrama any soap opera. She nonchalantly drops that she's been playing the field, yet insists Mr. Green is the daddy frontrunner due to his, ahem, cautious approach. It's like a plot twist in a mystery novel, except the detective is a potential dad, and the clues are a lot more personal. The stage is set for a messy dive into the truth, peppered with a dash of datum TV suspense. You admit to sleeping with another man while with Mr. Green, but say you're still positive he is is Angel's father because the other man used protection. Furthermore, you contend that Mr. Green is not solely supporting the child. In fact, you admit that both men are currently paying child support. We rewind to the days when Mr. Green and Miss Duncan's love story was all rainbows and butterflies before it spiraled into a saga worthy of a telenovela. From cute dates to colossal misunderstandings, it's a classic tale of romance gone awry, providing the juicy backstory to their current pickle. It's like watching a rom-com fast forward into a drama, setting the scene for their present day conundrum. Next up, something so wild, you'll need to see it to believe it. Mr. Green, how did you meet Miss Duncan? How did I meet her? Well, it was New Year's night. She was out, I was out, of course. I saw her staggering a little bit walking home alone from the club. I took her home. We did not sleep together. This was about three months later. So we first had sex around May, just like you say May. Waited, which is good, got to know one another, and then you had a sexual relationship. That's correct. 
The pregnancy bomb drops, and Mr. Green's world is rocked harder than a headliner at a rock concert. His mix of shock, confusion, and a smidge of panic is more gripping than a cliffhanger season finale. This moment isn't just a game changer, it's the scene that has viewers on the edge of their seats, wondering if popcorn is an appropriate snack for such intense drama. I got sick. I was eating buffalo wings, and I was start hurting in my right side real bad. They took me to the emergency room, and they told me that I had gallstones. Congratulations, you're nine and a half weeks pregnant. Really? So I called Mr. Green. You did? Yes. He's the first person you called? Yes. And so what was your reaction? Were you happy? I just couldn't believe it. I was in shock. You were 54 years old. Yes. You never yes, had Your another Honor. child. No, Your Honor. Did that just go down for real, or am I dreaming? As Mr. Green grills Ms. Duncan about the baby daddy mystery, the tension could cut through steel. Their argument is more heated than a debate on pizza toppings, laying bare the raw emotions and high stakes at play. It's a deep dive into a whirlpool of feelings and accusations, offering a front row seat to their personal turmoil and hinting at the stormy legal battles ahead. Told him you were pregnant, he says he was shocked. How did that come across to you through the phone? Did you feel like he didn't care, or did he sound happy? Yes, I felt that he didn't care. So did you tell the other guy you were pregnant too? I haven't seen the other guy like until after I got out of the hospital. Okay. If I'm supposed to be the child's father, I would have been there at the time of birth. And also, my name would be on the birth certificate, Your Honor. I was informed that she would call me. I said, well, call me when you get ready to have the child. With the possibility of another man in the picture, Mr. Green turns detective, questioning everything he thought was true. It's like watching a trust-building exercise go horribly wrong with added drama for flavor. This interrogation scene peels back layers of their relationship, revealing a maze of doubts and deception that would baffle even the sharpest of minds. So, Mr. Green, at what point did you find out there was another man in the picture? I'm getting to that right now, Your Honor. Okay. It was like six or seven months down the road after doing her pregnancy. That's after six or seven months. Of pregnancy or yes. when the baby was born? Six or seven months doing pregnancy. All right. And that's why I found out the baby may be who she said it may be. Okay, Three well, months pregnant. You told me that six, now seven you're gonna months. Now you going to tell I'm six or seven you months? You were about to have the baby almost no, about four no. more months to go. And so you out as a family and then come home and some other man is talking about he's coming to pick up your family. The story gets juicier as we look at the money and feelings all mixed up in this daddy mystery. It's like jumping into a big, messy pile of grown-up problems, where money and love are all mixed up like a smeared painting in the rain. This bit shows us the real, human side of court fights, full of sadness and headaches. Did you know he was gonna come pick you up after Mr. Green dropped you off? No, Did you have two dates in a row planned? No, Your Honor. So why was he just sitting up there? He probably just came by. I didn't know he was coming by. I didn't the baby's see, really, father? I really didn't see him until after the child was born. When did you come see the child? Well, how old she was? Two, three months? About one month. And the other guy was there for me. He was right there for me. The shocker that both guys might be tricked in the dad race is wilder than a twist in a spooky movie. Ms. Duncan's big secret flips the whole story upside down, making everyone think twice about what they've seen. It's a game changer that makes the tale even more twisty and emotional and totally gripping. So how, I'm how would you, you feel if I do the same thing to you? If I was how vice I was versa? Playing you. How was I was playing you, Mr. Green? How? How? Every time the baby needs shoes, the baby needs pampers, the baby needs this. Your daughter. Okay. Ms. Duncan. Yes, Your Honor. You just said for the first month he was not around, but the other guy was? The other guy was around all the way through my pregnancy. Really? Yes. Was he at the birth too? Yes. Focusing on Mr. Green and his bond with Angel brings a warm, fuzzy twist to the story. It shows how deep their connection is. Beyond just blood, it's a sweet reminder that family isn't just about DNA, but about the relationships we build and grow. This part really gets to the heart of what being a parent is all about with a dash of mushiness. Now Angel's two years old. Who does she regard as daddy? This guy? No, Your Honor. No. She just in his name. She called Mr. Green her daddy. So, Mr. Green, after being denied the opportunity to be at the birth, you now have established a relationship with the child so much so that she calls you daddy. Yes, Your Honor, which and that's why I want to step up to the plate and do more, because I don't want the child to grow up without a father. And I can see that it breaks both of you apart. Both of you are in tears right now. And is that because you feel like your mistakes have negatively affected this child, or you feel like you've had to hold back from her? 
talking about Angel's future, and the search for daddy facts digs into big, deep ideas, like a brainy talk but with more lawyer talk. It's a touching look at what makes us who we are and how we leave our mark, hitting home for anyone who's ever wondered about their place in the world. This chat is more than just legal blah blah, it's a deep think about who we are and our bonds with others. The other gentleman, is he supporting her? as well. He was. I haven't seen him in like three to four months. But up until about three or four months ago, he was providing for her? Yes. In what way? He like bring me like 200 or 300 a month. So he would give money And we take her. the baby shopping. And he get her clothes? Yes. When you look at Angel, which one of these men do you see? Mr. Green. You do? You think she looks like Mr. Green? Yes. The scene with the DNA results is like the biggest shock in a TV show finale, full of emotions and flipping everything upside down. What comes next is a roller coaster of feelings, making everyone deal with new truths and what family really means. In the case of Duncan versus Green, when it comes to the paternity of two year old Angel Bryant, Mr. Ronald Green, you are not her father. I'm so sorry. Mostly sorry for Angel. The episode opens with the introduction of the case of Baker versus Baker, where Ms. Baker is suing to prove to her husband, Mr. Baker, that he is the father of their three-month-old son, Caleb. Ms. Baker's marriage is on the line, hinging on the DNA results of the paternity test. In a twist that no one saw coming, the courtroom was buzzing with anticipation as the judge called for the results, not unlike the season finale of everyone's favorite drama series. Ms. Baker, you say the fate of your marriage is riding on today's DNA results. You are suing to prove that your three-month-old son, Caleb, was fathered by your husband, Mr. Baker. Yes, you're on. Mr. Baker. Unbelievable. Just when you think you've heard it all, Mr. Baker, scratching his head, can't help but wonder if his vasectomy had a secret return policy he wasn't aware of, considering Caleb's surprising arrival. Meanwhile, Ms. Baker, amidst her emotional turmoil, jokes about needing a detective more than a therapist, given the mysterious circumstances of her pregnancy. She also can't shake off the feeling that maybe the stork got confused and delivered them an extra special package. And if you thought this was wild, just wait until you hear about their past. Mr. Baker, you say it's medical impossible for you to have a child and therefore Caleb cannot be yours. You say if the DNA results prove you are not the father, you will leave your wife and family. You say the relationship truly is on the rocks. Explain. At the time I got pregnant, I um, was drinking quite a bit. I was drinking pretty much every day and I was blacking out at night and I wouldn't remember er periods of time I wasn't I wouldn't remember whether you were intimate with another man or yes, not. Yes, your honor. It's not fair to Mr. Baker, you know, and I love him with all my heart. You won't believe the roller coaster these two have been on. The Baker's relationship background is like the plot of a soap opera, but with more baking and less amnesia. They've swapped more than just recipes in their time, each indulging in a little side action while hitched to others. This sordid history of playing musical partners has left their trust for each other as shaky as a three-legged table. But stick around, because Ms. Baker's spotlight moment is next, and it's a doozy. Before this, was there a lack of trust in the relationship? Well, Your Honor, to be completely honest, when Felice and I had gotten together, the way that we got together was I had done some work in her home, and that's the way that we met. And we didn't do everything right. And I don't condone the actions that we took in our relationship. I was married, she was married. You have two people who are in a monogamous relationship come together the way that we did. There's always going to cast doubt on the back of your mind. How do I know she wouldn't do this to me? We did it to each other. So because of how we got together, decisions that we made, there's always been that little nagging. She did it to him, she'll do it to me. If he did it to her, he'll do it to just when things couldn't get any more intriguing, well, it turns out Ms. Baker is no stranger to the spotlight or financial shenanigans. Her cameo on The Oprah Winfrey Show for concealing a small treasure trove of debt from her ex-hubby is the stuff of legend, adding just the right amount of spice to her already simmering current marriage. The saga takes a pause here, but don't go anywhere. Mr. Baker's deep dive into his medical mystery is up next, and it's quite the story. Which show did you go on? The Oprah Winfrey Show. Okay, and I wanted you to confirm that because I actually do remember that episode. And and I remember your husband thought you were a certain amount of money in debt. Correct, Your Honor. But you were lying and it was, it was, the number was like... Tens of thousands of dollars. Exactly. Yeah. 
buckle up for this revelation. Mr. Baker, with the kind of enthusiasm usually reserved for sports fans recounting their team's greatest victories, delves into the intricacies of his vasectomy, detailing the extensive research he undertook. He concludes with the certainty of a man who's just solved a Rubik's Cube, blindfolded, that it was medically impossible for him to father a child after the procedure, especially after so many years have passed. The plot thickens from here as they consider the implications of this unexpected blessing. Back in 1991, when my ex was pregnant with our fourth child, while she was pregnant, I had a vasectomy. And so based upon the research that I have done regarding vasectomies, once the procedure hits the 20 year mark, they literally put it into the realm of impossibility. So since it's been 23 years after a vasectomy, you've got to question, is it even possible for me to even conceive a child? When you found this out, Mr. Baker, what was your first thought? I went on the internet. <laughs> I Googled what can cause a false positive. And there's only four conditions that a false positive will show up on a pregnancy test. Obviously, number one is pregnancy. Number two is ovarian cancer. Number three is uterus cancer. Number four is any cancerous tumors in the uterus. This next chapter is straight out of a fairy tale. In an unexpected twist that could rival any daytime soap opera, the couple found themselves deep in conversation about the what-ifs of reversing a vasectomy. Contemplating the creation of a mini-me together, they saw Ms. Baker's surprising bun in the oven as nothing short of a miracle, a cosmic do-over button, if you will, offering them a second shot at correcting past oopsies. And just when you thought it couldn't get any more heartwarming, Mr. Baker's reaction to the big news is priceless. In a scene filled with suspense, as Mr. Baker absorbs the news, a dramatic pause sweeps the room. You could hear a pin drop, or in this case, a jaw. From God, because of the baby, I quit drinking. So I just took it from God that he put this baby in my stomach to um, save me from my drinking. And also I was um, taking pills. Our one regret was that we never had a child together. We contacted a gentleman who is the predominant specialist on vasectomy reverse in the entire nation located in San Diego. And they sent us a package because we discussed getting a reversal so that we can have a child and threw the package away. And then six months later, we regretted that we threw it away and we ordered a second one. Went through the same process again and regrettably, we threw away that second one. And now your wife is pregnant. You know, my attitude is very simple. It better be a miracle from God. Mr. Baker, you are the father. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. King is pretty sure Mr. Porter is her kid's dad and wants a test to prove it, hoping it'll fix their bumpy relationship. She's all about making things right for their son Kalen's sake. She's so set on smoothing things over, she's considering adding family detective to her resume. After all, who else can navigate this soap opera with a toddler in tow? Ms. King, you are here to prove to your on again, off again boyfriend, Mr. Porter, that your three-year-old son Kylan is his biological child. You say his denial has destroyed your relationship and you need today's results. Incredible, right? Mr. Porter isn't convinced he's the dad, blaming medical reasons and their past ups and downs. He talks about giving their relationship another shot when he found out Ms. King was pregnant, even though he was also seeing someone else. It's like he's auditioning for a role in The Young and the Indecisive. He wonders if there's a chapter in parenting books on how to deal with love triangles and paternity puzzles. You won't believe what comes next. It's not the fact that I'm not stepping up. It's just the fact that I have doubt if I'm the father. When we was together, we was, you know, had our problems off and on and um, when we broke up I went back to New York the female I was talking to at the time and Miss King they were exchanging text messages between each other Celicia told the other female that uh, she was pregnant and um, when I found out I went to Celicia myself I said are you pregnant she said yes she was I said okay so I decided to rekindle our relationship due to the fact that it might be my child can you believe what happened? Ms. King fesses up that she fibbed about being pregnant at first to grab Mr. Porter's attention, but then it turned out she really was pregnant. This twist adds more drama to their already complicated story. It's like she accidentally cast herself as the lead in, I didn't know I was pregnant, or did I? Suddenly, their life story is one plot twist away from becoming a primetime special. But hold on, the plot thickens even more. I told him that I was pregnant, but I really wasn't pregnant. Oh! oh. Now, all right, Mr. Porter, so then, Miss King admits she lied and said she was pregnant. What happens? She tells you 
You're well, pregnant, what time, happened? She, at the time, she told me she was pregnant, so I believed her. Decided, because I didn't have my father in my life, I decided I'm gonna step up to the plate regardless. So I was there throughout the whole everything. But maybe about a month after her telling me she was pregnant, she walked in the room with a pregnancy test and was just waving it around like she was pregnant. I was confused. Then I started to think like, how you pregnant? You know, like if, if a month went by and you now I'm pregnant, I was confused like, I can't be the father, like, that don't make no sense. So you thought she had been with another guy yeah. and was really trying to pin the baby on you right, because or I, either trap you with the baby because she wanted case. to stay with you. Right. When I seen him with someone else, it's just like, that's supposed to be us, that's not supposed to be y'all. So I told him I was pregnant, and eventually I was going to tell him that I wasn't pregnant, but during that time that I was going to tell him that I was, I actually found out that I was pregnant. Because you was really trying to get pregnant because you knew I you had lied. I basically tried to get Go pregnant. Go on, just yeah. tell the truth, girl. We already know what happened. <laughs> you worked real hard at that. Just when you thought it couldn't get more complex, things get more tangled when it turns out Ms. King had another guy on standby to play dad if Mr. Porter bailed. This bombshell throws even more doubt on who the real dad is. In her defense, Ms. King insists she was just keeping her options open like a strategic player in the game of life. But really, it's less chess master and more Mari Povich's dream episode. The next revelation is something you won't want to miss. I grabbed the phone and um, I looked, I seen some text messages between her and another guy. So that right there was like, but why were you going through my phone? We're not together. So wait a minute. This is a picture of you in the hospital. Correct. When he holding. was first born. When he was first born, I was the first one to hold him. As I presented to the courtroom, I have text messages showing of what her and the fellow was talking about before and this picture And you submitted took those it. text messages yes, to the court? Yes, ma'am. All right. Ms. King writes in the hospital about to have the baby. The other man responds, cool, is George signing the birth certificate? Ms. King responds, no, he doesn't want to be responsible. Other man says, I will sign the birth certificate. <laughs> Ms. King says, okay, great. <laughs> It was just a joke. This next part is utterly bewildering. Ms. King tries to prove Mr. Porter is the father by saying their son is short just like him. Mr. Porter, on the other hand, worries that lead poisoning he had as a kid might mean he can't have kids, showing he's really unsure. He's considering whether his superhero name should be Lead Man, with the power to create uncertainty and evade responsibility. But just when you think it's all over, there's one more twist. Just when you think you've seen it all, ultimately, a DNA test shows Mr. Porter is. As you can see, the average male is actually 5'9. George is 5'2. Each time that I take my son to the, the doctor to get his wellness check, he actually falls between the lower percentile of height wise through 3 foot 5 inches. My son is 3 feet. Me and George both are short, so it's guaranteed that my son is going to be short. We'll just say that that's a little bit of evidence, right? Yes. You could have had sex with another short man <laughs> if you want to rely on short. Your Honor, uh, at the same token, I have. Um medical problem presented it to the court. Uh, when I was a, a child, I was diagnosed with the second highest case of lead poisoning in the state of New York. Really? Right. And I'm 26 right now, and uh, I have never had any children in, at all until this situation. So I, I was confused at the same time. Because I have you fear. believe the lead poisoning. Right. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Porter, you are the father. Yeah. 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 In the case of Murray versus Lee, Ms. Murray seeks legal recognition of Mr. Lee as the father of her 14-month-old daughter, Winter. She demands that he acknowledge paternity and take responsibility following conclusive DNA test results. This legal battle highlights the complexities of parental responsibilities and the use of DNA evidence in paternity disputes. You are here today to get Mr. Lee to stop denying that he fathered your 14-month-old daughter, Winter. You demand he man up and own up to his responsibility after after today's DNA test. Can you believe the twist in the tale? Mr. Lee admits to a previous relationship with Ms. Murray, but contests the claim that he is Winter's father. He points to Ms. Murray's relationships with other men during the time of conception, casting doubt on the child's paternity. This dispute underscores the challenges in establishing paternity in cases with multiple potential fathers. And just when you think you've heard it all, the drama escalates. You had a one-night stand with Ms. Murray before her pregnancy, but claim she later confirmed she was not pregnant by you. You admit to one night, but state she had multiple men and there's no way you are her child's 
father. In a shocking turn of events, Ms. Murray labels Mr. Lee a deadbeat father, criticizing his absence in Winter's life and his refusal to accept paternity. She emphasizes their past relationship and his denial of responsibility, showcasing the emotional and legal struggles faced by single mothers seeking support from the child's father. But the story takes an even deeper dive next. Well, basically, Your Honor, Mr. Lee is a deadbeat. He has not done anything for Winter. That's ludicrous. I have six other kids. Exactly. And I am not the father of her baby. She wants this because she's trying to pin this baby on me because she know I'm a good guy and I'm a good father. You're not a good anything. You're a deadbeat. You barely take care of them six kids that you got. And you Winter's just... 15 months and you're saying that Mr. Lee hasn't done anything he for? He has not done nothing. The plot thickens as the backstory of Ms. Murray and Mr. Lee's relationship is revealed, tracing its origins to a decade ago when she was a dancer and he a patron. Their acquaintance evolved into a personal relationship, setting the stage for the current paternity dispute and highlighting the long and complex history between the parties involved. The following scene sheds more light on their contentious dynamic. Okay. Uh, how did you all meet? I met Mr. Lee at the club. I used to be a dancer and he was my customer for about 10 years. So that's really how I met him. He was infatuated <laughs> with showbiz. But once he got to know Demiki, he did not <laughs> like me. And he's taking it but out on the But he was your customer for yeah, 10 that, years. Some yes. lies, Delving deeper into their history, the narrative delves into the details of Ms. Murray and Mr. Lee's first sexual encounter, marked by a controversial moment involving condom use. This incident leads to further disputes about their interactions and questions regarding paternity, illustrating the complexities surrounding consent and contraceptive use in intimate relationships. The next moment is even more revealing. Well, it was after the club. She texted me. I, I came didn't text over. You. I came over. You know, and unfortunately, you know, I broke the golden rule. You broke the what? The golden rule. The golden rule? Yes. What's the golden rule? You never, you never use the stripper's comp. Never. That, it was I not did. mine, baby. Oh, it was yours. Oh, the golden <laughs> rule is yeah. you never use a condom that the stripper gives you. Yeah, you bring you bring it on. And the tension escalates as Mr. Lee's initial doubts about paternity are highlighted as he inquires about Ms. Murray's menstrual cycle, which she claims resumed, suggesting non-paternity. This interaction demonstrates the anxieties and misunderstandings that can arise in the aftermath of unproducted sexual encounters. Prepare for another twist in the tale. You know, for like weeks, you know, I was asking, hey, have your period came? You know, I was steady. I was on her about it. You, you know, was asking, oh, you were nervous. You was asking yes, me that I because would. you was yes, trying to keep up with my ovulation because yes. you was trying to get me pregnant. How did you find out she was not pregnant? Well, like a couple of weeks after that, I texted her and she was like, hey, you can stop bugging me. My period came. Just like that, she told me. Just when you thought it couldn't get more complicated, a second unproducted sexual encounter between Ms. Murray and Mr. Lee occurs under the mistaken belief that she was already pregnant. This misunderstanding contributes to the confusion surrounding the timeline of conception, emphasizing the importance of clear communication and understanding in sexual relationships. But wait, there's more intrigue ahead. First That's time we had sex. The second time that we had sex, we did not use a condom. I had sex with her unprotectedly the second time because she had already told me she was already pregnant. The plot takes another turn, as Ms. Murray's admission of sexual activity with another man within the same time frame complicates the paternity issue. This revelation narrows the window of conception to a critical few days, highlighting the difficulties in determining paternity in cases of multiple sexual partners. The following evidence might just change everything. Mr. Lee? It was one other person. When do you believe you had sex with Mr. Lee the second time? You said the first time was March the 3rd. Mm -hmm. When was the second time? It was March the 30th. March 30th. Mm -hmm. All right, so when did you have sex with the other guy? It was probably like a week before that. So around the third week probably. in March. Mm -hmm. In an attempt to clarify the murky waters, the court employs a conception calculator to determine the possible window of conception, aligning it with Ms. Murray's sexual encounters and implicating Mr. Lee. This use of technology in court illustrates the judicial system's efforts to resolve complex paternity cases, but the emotional roller coaster doesn't stop here. If we go back to the calendar, that is the same window of time where you were <laughs> intimate with both men. <laughs> So, Mr. Lee, you see you fall in the window of conception. Do you remember <laughs> that second time? It was April the 3rd. I, it, it was, was April not the April. 3rd. How do you know it was the 3rd? Because I was hosting a party that day, and after my party, that's when I hit her up and she came. April the 3rd. You hit me up after the club that Thursday night when I left, and I came to where you were, and we had sex, and I got pregnant. 
adding another layer to the saga, the contrast between Mr. Lee's absence and the involvement of another potential father in Winter's life is discussed by Ms. Murray. Mr. Lee's reluctance to accept responsibility without certainty of paternity is underscored, reflecting the emotional and legal challenges in establishing fatherhood. The climax is just around the corner, and you won't believe what happens next. As the curtains draw on this drama, the climax of the case occurs with the revelation of DNA test results. Ms. Murray, did you ever tell the other guy you were pregnant? Yes. You did. And what was his Response. I mean, he's still relevant in my life, but he's not... He's active with Winter. They take pictures together. Oh! Winter takes multiple pictures with multiple guys, so I don't, don't know what's do going that. on. Don't do that. Don't do that. But that's the truth. We here, I'm here don't to Don't try truth. to do that. Well, hold on. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Lee, you are the father. <laughs> woo, woo! Is that what your baby say? <laughs> your baby like to say, woo, woo! The episode kicks off with the kind of formalities you'd expect at a bingo night at Buckingham Palace, as Miss Yancey and Mr. Thomas strut into court, ready to unravel the mystery of baby Kahari's paternity. It's like a game show, but with more at stake than a new toaster. Miss Yancey's on a mission to prove Mr. Thomas is the daddy, hoping it'll be the glue to mend their rocky romance. Miss Yancey, you are here to save your family by proving to your boyfriend that he fathered your seven-month-old son, Kahari. You testify that his paternity denial is terrible you apart. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Can you believe the tension here? Miss Yancey lays it all out, saying the paternity test isn't just for kicks, it's the key to possibly saving their family from turning into a soap opera rerun. The doubts swirling around little Kahari's dad have put their relationship on thinner ice than a dieting penguin. Meanwhile, Mr. Thomas, spurred on by incriminating snapshots of Miss Yancey and the Bambino with some mystery due day, is starting to think his role in this drama might be more understudy than leading man. Hold on, because the story takes an even wilder turn next. You claim that after finding pictures of Miss Yancey and the baby with another man, you are convinced you are not Kahari's biological father. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. So, Ms. Yancey, tell us why this court date is so important. Well, we've been having a few issues ever since my baby was born. It would go, you know, he was there through the entire pregnancy, and um, we would go back and forth after the baby was born about, you know, the baby doesn't look like him, the baby looks like me, or, you know, the baby... So you feel like this paternity resolution mm -hmm. is important in terms of saving your relationship? Um, yes, Your Honor. Right now, Honor, Your Honor, it's, it's hard, you know, because I do love her and all. Throughout the whole relationship, we always talked about having a child together. We're at a point where we ha it's a child, but I possibly might not be the father, you know, so it, it kind of hurts, so... I was on the edge of my seat when the plot thickens, as the duo dives into the tumultuous telenovela that is their love life, complete with commercial breaks of breakups and guest appearances by other love interests. This roller coaster romance has everyone wondering if baby Kahari might just have more potential daddies than a Mamma Mia audition. You won't believe what's coming up as we delve deeper into the drama. We were just getting back together. We were still, um... There was a little brief breakup? Yeah. Okay. He was seeing somebody, and then I started seeing somebody, but basically Basically, it, that all transpired from us just not being pretty much truthful with each other. Broken up, or were you together? More like friends with benefits. Yeah, well... But were you also dating and sleeping with other people? I didn't start dating and sleeping with other people until Maurice had seen me giving my friend a ride. We were going out. He seen me at the gas station with him and all this uh, stuff came out. He started cussing me out and following me in, in my car. If you're in a relationship with somebody, we, we, we weren't in a you don't go and like... give another man a, a ride and not But I thought it... y'all said you all were broken right. up. Right, exactly. But he at the same time, she's persistent. still calling me. She'll still come to my mom's house, ask for little things, you know what I mean, to help her out with this or that. I would. So if we're so broken up, there's no need for you to come ask me. Go ask your new friend. Why would you take it upon yourself to follow me in my car to... And that's the thing. To, See, I'm she, talking to my new friend. Why said, are you she following. said I was following her, but at that time, uh, where, we, where we live at, it, it's the weekend, so everyone goes to the gas station, they hang out, and then they go to the clubs. That's all what? we're doing. <laughs> is that That's what we're doing now? For you. <laughs> that sounds like high school. Y'all look is. too old. 
this next part is jaw-dropping. Mr. Thomas reminisces about his initial thrill at the thought of being a dad. Visions of playing catch and awkward birds and bees, talks danced in his head. But then, reality crashes the party with timing. As suspicious as a surprise visit from the in-laws and Miss Yancey's bombshell that Kahari might not be his, throws him for a loop. And just when you think you've seen it all, the next moment will truly astonish you. So, uh, Mr. Thomas, take me to the time you found out Miss Yancey was pregnant. When did you find that out? We were sitting at my mom's house and you know, she came and she said that she took a pregnancy test and she's pregnant. And I'm like, you know, I was happy for the simple fact that over the years we were trying to conceive and have a baby. And I'm, I'm, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, yes, it finally happened. And then after she told me, she left and texted me that the baby might not be mine. That's correct. Oh! And um, I told him, and once I started thinking about the conception date and the day I conceived, we were on a breakup. And I was seeing someone else. And so was he. But it's like you were already seeing someone before the breakup, if that's the case. No, if that's the case, it was the same with you. The intensity escalates just when Mr. Thomas thought the plot couldn't get any twistier. He stumbles upon those photos of Miss Yancey playing happy families with another man and Kahari. Miss Yancey, caught in the flashbulb, tries to explain it away by saying even her mom is playing detective on Kahari's paternity case. Brace yourself, the revelation in the next segment is something you can't miss. Um, we had took a trip to uh, Fresno to go visit family. I end up going through her phone and I noticed that she has pictures with Kahari and the other man that could possibly be the father. Oh, really? Why were you taking pictures with the other guy, Miss Yancey? My mom looked at him and she told me straight up, I don't think that that's Maurice's son, and I think that you should get in contact with his biological father. And that's and cool and all, but at the same time, if we're together, why couldn't you have just told me? Why hide it and make it a big deal? Right, and I understand that. I can understand where he's coming from on that aspect. And so, like I said, I never meant for it to go that way, but my intentions was to explain to him and but tell after, him. But after how long? It feels like we're in a thriller now. The past couple of months have been like navigating a minefield in a clown car for these two. Dodging doubts and tiptoeing around the truth of Kahari's dad, they're both a bundle of nerves and hopes, knowing the paternity test results could either be their ticket to a happy ending or the season finale nobody wanted. The upcoming reveal is set to turn everything on its head, just when you think the story couldn't get more gripping. In a plot twist that would have M. Night Shyamalan nodding in approval, the paternity test results drop the bomb. Mr. Thomas. Well, what's him what's of important, the Your Honor? If he's not around, well, how is it important to him? He's not there every night so you, waking up, changing, making bottles. So you send him pictures of Kahari? Every now and again. And, and that's something I just found out right now. I never knew that. Yeah, just like I found out just recently when we took the trip to Fresno that he was actually born with extra fingers on both sides of his uh, hands. That, Who that, was? The other potential dad. Now that is an incredible coincidence. Oh, it's so negative on my end. It's all this negative. He's done stuff too. He's made. But what I've our done, what I've done, didn't bring a, a child in our relationship. It doesn't matter. We're not, we're not, it doesn't matter. Our mistakes you, you didn't okay, bring us you, here today. You, you didn't bring a child. Have you thought about what you're gonna do if you're not the biological father? If I'm not the biological father, then I'm gonna step away and let her continue to put the other man in Kahari's life so he could be his father, like she wants. If the baby's not your biological child, you're done with the whole relationship. In a way, yes. He's saying that. In a way, yeah. see, now we back to Lucy Goosey, which didn't get us anywhere in the first place. Well, yes, yes, because I, I don't want to be sitting around just being a stepdad while you're, while I'm raising a kid. That's you're, crazy you're... because you've been a stepdad for almost five years. And, and five all years, my I'm other tired kids. of being a stepdad. You're tired of being a stepdad? Well, then you need to figure it out. This is, it's, it's deeper than this. You need to figure it out regardless. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Thomas, you are not the father. I'm very sorry. It's okay, Your Honor. It's all right. I mean, I, could, I, I still love her, and I still love him at the end of the day, but if she wants... ...to present his case against you, you haven't seen your son since a lifelong secret came exposed just two months ago. The court has already issued a paternity test, and those results... Can you believe what just happened? So, Mr. Weeks is spilling the tea about how his family's rumor mill has been churning faster than a gossip blogger on Deadline. These whispers and side-eyes at family gatherings made him more skeptical about his origins than I am about my diet's cheat day turning into a cheat year. And just when you thought it couldn't get more bonkers, hold on to your hats. How you became suspicious that 
the man that raised you may not be well, your biological father. It started around like I was nine years old. I heard, I kept hearing rumors from outside family members that Maurice might not be my father or I might not be his son. Holy moly, did you see that? Miss Moore is playing it cooler than a cucumber in a freezer, claiming she'd have spilled the beans if only her son had popped the question. It's like saying, oh, I would have totally told you about your surprise birthday party if you just asked. Stick around because the next part is a doozy. I, I listened to my mom. She said, Maurice, it's your father. That's, that's in a subject. Now, okay, okay. Miss Moore, but you I said had, that he never asked you. He never asked me, and uh, uh, quite honestly, if my son had asked me, I would have told him, but I would have also told him not to say anything because I didn't want my mother to know. You were I... reluctant just because you didn't want your mother to reject Buckle up, folks. Mr. Weeks finally confronts his mom about the daddy dilemma, leading to her shrugging her shoulders like she's trying to decide what to have for dinner. Eh, could be this guy, could be that guy. Who's to say? This bombshell moment could probably turn their family tree into a family bush. But wait, it's about to get even juicier. The plain blank, I like, you couldn't, you can't lie to me no more. I can't, I can't hear that Maurice Weeks is your father. I, I had to know the truth. And she I came, have she no came problem to, with that she because came to I want to know. I she had... came to me and said, I don't know who is your father. No way. Did that just happen? Miss Moore is standing her ground like a lone warrior in a battlefield, defending her title as Mom of the Year, secrets and all. She talks about her sacrifices like she's been on a reality show called Survivor, the parenting edition. You're not going to want to miss what's next. It's mind-boggling. I wasn't going to jeopardize that to Your take Honor. that away from my son, who Earl know for a fact had a baby. Earl was on the road with this man. He bonded with this man. He loved this man. This man loved him. I wasn't going to change. This is too much, and it's confession time. Miss Moore's emotional turmoil could win an award for best dramatic performance as she navigates the choppy waters of hope, fear, and what the heck have I done regarding her son's upbringing. It's like watching a behind-the-scenes featurette of every parent's inner monologue. But hold on, the next scene will knock your socks off. Mr. Weeks, did you grow up loving Maurice? I grew up crazy about this man. <laughs> like, I had to be in his pocket just to get to make sure he don't leave me. That's true. It just hurt, Your Honor. It hurt that count. As a child of both of them, I had to come to them. Are you ready for this? Oh, Miss Moore and Ms. Walker go head to head, turning the courtroom into a verbal WWE match, but with more class and less spandex. Their exchange is so fiery, it could roast marshmallows. But keep your eyes peeled, because what comes next is the cherry on top. I don't owe you nothing. You don't, you owe me Them, please. This is unreal. The emotional roller coaster hits its peak when the paternity test results are unveiled, proving that plot twists aren't just for novels. The man who played dad isn't the biological ticket holder, sending shockwaves through the courtroom like a dropped mic at a rap battle. This revelation not only serves a slice of heartbreak, but also dishes out a reality check that's harder to swallow than my aunt's holiday fruitcake. And just when you think you've seen it all, the next twist is going to be epic. As it relates to Mr. Earl Weeks, Mr. Weeks, the man who has raised you for the past 29 years is not your biological father. Oh the episode kicks off with Mr. Rich practically bursting at the seams for some clarity, while others can't help but chime in, turning the room into a verbal ping-pong match. The judge, in a bid to avoid a full-blown circus, calls for calm as accusations start flying like pies in a slapstick comedy. The tension and emotional fireworks make it clear we're not in for a snooze fest, but a roller coaster of feelings and legal drama from the get-go. Mr. Rich, Go back up. you came Just here to get up. an answer. I have not called him lately. I don't care, man. Oh, I mean, hey, hey, calm down. Calm down. My phone tells you it all. Shit. Calm down. Your Honor, calm that down. was a nice speech. That was a nice speech, but that's all it was, a speech. Stop. Can you believe what unfolded? Ms. Holman goes into meltdown mode, showing just how much this legal tangle has frayed her nerves. The judge, in a surprising twist of empathy, steps into the role of unofficial therapist, recognizing the tough spot Ms. Holman's in, trying to navigate the truth through a fog of emotions, all the while wishing she could just Netflix and chill her worries away. Just you wait, the next part is even more jaw-dropping. I see you breaking down, that's okay. Truth coming out. I not about truth. listen, I'm not, I'm not listen. a bad person, I do bad things. Look at me, the difference. look at me. You've admitted to where you've gone wrong, and you've also allowed us to see a little piece of what your real heart 
Just when you thought it couldn't get more intriguing, here comes the plot twist. Mr. Rich is not just about the money, folks. The judge tips his hat to Mr. Rich's maturity and heart of gold, painting him as the unsung hero of the courtroom drama. It's a moment that adds a dash of nobility to the paternity puzzle, making us wonder if Mr. Rich might just be the prince charming in this twisted fairy tale. The emotional roller coaster doesn't stop here. Up next is a confession that will tug at your heartstrings. Take a deep breath. What it is, Listen, though. we you want the truth? I, that's what I'm trying to get for you, but you got to let me get it. You want to know? I'm giving you the truth, but you've got to sit through and you've got to listen. We're here now and we're going to get through this. We can't get to the other side. We cannot get to the other side unless we go through. We're going through. Mr. Matthews, thank you for joining us. Yes, ma'am. We've heard significant testimony today. Brace yourselves for the raw emotion, Mr. Matthews' testimony and emotional investment. Mr. Matthews steps up, laying bare his heart and his hopes of being Alani's dad. It's a soap opera-worthy confession that adds another layer of emotional complexity, reminding everyone that at the heart of this legal kerfuffle is a child caught in the crossfire of grown-up problems. Stay tuned as Ms. Holman's tale up next is as entangled as it gets. I met Mrs. Holman probably about uh, four years ago. I met her through Facebook and we hung out and we clicked. And then there on four, we had a relation, a sexual relationship on and on. When did the sexual relationship start? I, I can't recall that it's a possibility that I could be the baby's father. You've had an ongoing sexual relationship with Miss Holman for the past four years? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And you believe you could be Alani's biological father? Yes, ma'am. And I was... So you went to doctor's appointments as well? Yes, ma'am. Do you want to be her biological father? I mean, if I am, I'll accept it as my own. You won't see this coming. Ms. Holman's confession and justification. Ms. Holman takes the stand, and it's confession time. Her tale of love and confusion is more tangled than last year's Christmas lights, shedding light on her journey through the murky waters of relationships and paternity, all in the quest for truth and maybe a bit of daytime fame. But hold on, the saga draws nearer to an emotional crescendo that promises to leave no heart untouched. Now granted, have I been with all three of these men? Yes. How do you know there's only these three men? Because I gave them these three men no. name. This is my truth. Here it is. It's ugly. Now I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. Exactly. Y'all. Exactly. What I'm saying is it boils down exactly. to Exactly. No, but no, no. The bottom line is this. The bottom line is this. None of them will be here if you were sure. None of them will be here if None of us will be here. None of us had multiple sex partners, bro. The anticipation builds up, emotional resolution, and readiness for results. The judge, dabbling as a wise old sage, preps the courtroom for the big reveal with a pep talk on self-worth that could rival any motivational speaker. It's a heartwarming lead-up to the moment of truth, setting the scene for a resolution that promises more twists than a pretzel factory. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. The paternity results are about to be unveiled. This is the climax you've been waiting for. Paternity results in conclusion. Drum roll, please. If you gotta look in the mirror every morning and say, I am worth You have to tell yourself. You have to encourage yourself. Do you understand me? It's not easy. You're not the only woman out here in the fight or man. Every day, we wake up and we have to remind ourselves, you worth it. I slept with this guy on Thursday. You still worth it. I slept with this guy on Friday. You still worth it. I lied to this guy on Sunday. You still worth it. I came up short over here. You still worth it. You're still worth it. You hear me? These results were prepared by DNA Diagnostics, and they read as follow. The first envelope is for Mr. Rich. Mr. Rich is not the father. Mr. Matthews, you are not the father. Mr. Drumgold, you are the father. Exactly. The case of Funzie versus Irvin kicks off with Ms. Funzie dropping the baby bombshell. That little Jorkeem, barely old enough to throw a proper tantrum, is supposedly Mr. Irvin's mini-me. Mr. Irvin, however, isn't buying what she's selling, especially since Ms. Funzie had previously spilled the beans about a steamy affair. Ms. Funzie, you have opened your case to save your family. You are here to prove your one-month-old baby Jorkeem Irvin is your boyfriend, Mr. Irvin's biological son. You say you and Mr. Irvin have two other children and you plan to have this third child. You blame his sister for stirring up his ridiculous doubts. Is that correct? So, what you're about to hear is the straight out of a soap opera. Ms. Funzie, clearly worried about their seven-year love saga turning into a tearjerker, voices her fears about Mr. Irvin's baby denial drama. The tension is thick enough to cut with a knife, and not even a batch of freshly baked cookies could sweeten the souring relationship. But folks, you won't believe what's coming next. My family's on the line. I love Jordan. We've been dating going on seven years, and been 
been dated since the 10th grade. And at the denying that he has towards my one more old child, Joaquin, which we plan to have together. And just when you thought it couldn't get any juicier, cue the dramatic music as Ms. Funzie's side hustle with another man comes crashing into the spotlight. Mr. Irvin turned detective, snooping through her phone like he's auditioning for a spy movie, and discovers the incriminating sleepover at a friend's house. Stick around, because you haven't seen anything yet. How did you find out she cheated? One day I was, um, I couldn't sleep, so here it is, four in the morning, so, um, I seen her sleeping and her phone was right beside her. Some told me to just go through her phone, so I found out that she, um, she spent the night at her friend's house with this other guy. But I came to him and let him know that I cheated on him. After he cheated out, she always going out. He could never he go, go out with his friends he, too, uh, also. No, You'll need to sit down for this one. In a plot twist worthy of a daytime TV award, Ms. Funzie admits to her revenge cheating spree, framing it as a one-hit wonder to get back at Mr. Irvin for his own love crimes. She planned to come clean eventually, probably after binge-watching confessionals on reality TV. But wait, it's about to get even crazier. I cheated the night of my friends because I had wanted to get revenge for him cheating on me. Once I said, I talked to the guy and I hooked up with him the night of my friend's dinner, and we had used protection, and I had sex with him one time. So you had sex with this man one time? Yes, and I used And protection. you used protection? Yeah. Grab your popcorn, folks. The plot thickens when Mr. Irvin plays amateur gynecologist, scrutinizing the ultrasound like it's a treasure map, but can't make heads or tails of the pregnancy timeline. His suspicionometer is off the charts, thinking Ms. Funzie might have pulled a fast one with the paperwork. And oh boy, What's next is just unbelievable. How soon after you found out she was cheating, confronted her, say like, did you find out she was pregnant? When we went to the mobile um, ultrasound, I wanted to see how many weeks she was. And when she came out with the paper, I couldn't understand how, the number of how many weeks she was. Like, they drew the no man cursive or something. They drew one week and two days. And you saw the lady hand me the paper off the bus. You parked right outside, and you saw her hand me the paper. I didn't know if she was pregnant by me or someone else, so I People just let it go. Because you were concerned about the date. Yes. But it should have been on the paperwork. Yeah, it was. I it was couldn't understand the paperwork. Just when you think you've seen it all, despite the swirling paternity drama, Mr. Irvin steps up to the plate, attending every prenatal appointment and even signing the birth certificate. Judge Lake raises an eyebrow, wondering if Mr. Irvin's just a hopeless romantic or setting himself up for a world of legal headaches. The next part will have you on the edge of your seat. Did you sign the birth certificate? Yes. And you signed the birth certificate even though you had doubt? Why? Because I had, I wasn't sure whether he was mine or not and I wanted to do the right thing by it because I was there. I truly understand your sentiment and that it comes from a good place. You do understand that that's a bad decision when you have paternity doubt. I told him that. If you got doubts, don't sign that birth certificate because whether that's your child or not, you're gonna have, that's acknowledging, hey, I'm gonna be there for this child for 18 years. Are you ready for this? Ms. Funzie, in a bid to play genetic detective, points to Joaquim's knock knees as a family heirloom from Mr. Irvin's gene pool because, obviously, knee angles are the new DNA test in town. You won't want to miss what comes after this. They all have knock knees just like Jordan. You even submitted evidence to the court, right, about the knock knees. You feel yes. like they got the same? Yes. Knock knees. Oh, they're... Okay. They say they all got the same knees and the same body shape, and you say Joaquin got the same thing. Yes, Your Honor. And you believe these knock knees are hereditary and the body shape is yeah. an indication. This is where it gets downright wacky. Enter Dr. Eddie Richardson, the voice of reason, who basically says knock knees as a paternity test is about as reliable as using a magic eight ball to make life decisions. The courtroom is left wondering what's next, a comparison of baby hair swirls. But hold your horses, the roller coaster isn't over yet. Sir, I'd like to know from you, can you explain what knock knees are and if they are a genetic trait? I certainly can. Your Honor. Yes, knock knees, it is when the knees point in toward each other, and more technically, when someone stands straight up and there's about a three inch gap between their ankle and they can't put their legs together, but the knees are together. Kids go through this as they're born, they actually do ha can have bow legs and then go into knock knees, and then they straighten up by the time they're six to eight years old. I would say, in my expert opinion, it would be very difficult to determine this at this age. Okay. Knowing that the variants happen in children less than six years old. So, Ms. Fonzie, as you listen to Dr. Richardson's testimony, does that change your belief? Yeah, I understand what he's talking about, but it's still, they all have knock knees. Brace yourselves for a wild ride. Just when you think it couldn't get any messier, the other man spills the tea, claiming their one-time rendezvous was more like a mini-series with multiple episodes. Ms. Funzie's credibility is hanging by a thread thinner than the plot of a bad soap opera. You're not going to believe what happens next. So this courtroom has tracked down this other man. He has submitted a statement to the court. It says, 
We eventually got each other's phone numbers and started texting. She told me about the things that was going on between her and Jordan. The first time me and her had sex, she came over and saw me. We had sex in Jordan's car. That's, that's a lie. And that's a did lie. use Somebody protection. Somebody fake page. That's, that's you, a lie. You, you said Jordan, it. that's a lie. You know say that post Jordan and Norton. Let me finish no, the no. statement. Somebody ain't lying, Jordan. Why is you lying to me, Jordan? Jordan, I'm not lying to you. Man, if this not my baby, I'm through with this relationship. That, okay, that that's fine. I hope you're sitting down for this bombshell. Under the glaring courtroom lights, Ms. Funzie crumbles like a cookie under interrogation, admitting to not just one, but a series of rendezvous. The truth bomb detonates, leaving their relationship in shambles and the court gasping for air. But wait, there's more. The grand finale is up next. No. Or did you have sex with this other man more than one time? Yes or no? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, it was more than one time or it was a one night stand? It was more than one time. You go okay. okay. You won't see this twist coming. In a finale that no one saw coming, except maybe everyone, the DNA results cast Mr. Winfield as. The biological father is Mr. Winfield. Mm. I know what I told you. I, I knew it wasn't his baby. Before. Jordan, we went to the hospital and saw that baby. She knew it wasn't. I know they tried. Down. The show starts with Judge Lake, supercharged on his morning brew, zipping through his hello to what's gonna be the courtroom showdown to remember. Ms. Johnson, after a long time playing Guess Who with her memories, decides it's finally time to figure out who Damien's dad is. She's pointing her finger at the defendant's late brother, kicking off an episode that's gonna twist and turn more than a bag of pretzels. Ms. Johnson, after years of pain and suffering, you've petitioned the court for a DNA test to answer the question your son Damien has had all his life. Who is my father? You believe the defendant's deceased brother, Mr. Damien Ellerson, is the answer, and the DNA results will prove that today. Ms. Fortune's not buying what Ms. Johnson's selling, mainly because Ms. Johnson's love life's been more like a game of musical chairs. Even though she's giving Ms. Johnson the stink eye, she admits if her bro is the dad, it's kind of a big deal, making her feelings messier than a mixed-up Rubik's Cube. You claim your brother cannot be the father because Ms. Johnson has admitted to sleeping with other men. But if today's results prove he is the dad, he would be his only biological child. Then there's Damien, stepping into the limelight, ready to solve the who's my daddy mystery that's been tailing him forever. His search for the truth is more addictive than your favorite series, showing just how much this dad dilemma has been bugging him. Mr. Damien Johnson, yes, sir. you lived for years without knowing who your father is, and today you hope to finally have the truth. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Get ready for the waterworks as Ms. Johnson goes down memory lane, talking about her and Mr. Damien Ellerson. It's so sappy, you'll need tissues or maybe the whole box as she spills their love story. Sappy enough to be a bestseller. Why are you so positive Mr. Ellerson is Damien's biological father? Damien, he was my first love. I would do anything anything for him. We were together all I, all the time. And it just, I know in my heart that he is his father. And you say it was your first love? Yes. What was it about him you loved? Just his energy, his smile. I mean, he was like he didn't have a care in the world. It makes you emotional to see his picture? It does, because I'd give anything to have him back. Just when you think it can't get any crazier, boom. Turns out Damien's dad could be one of a few guys. Ms. Johnson, stirring the pot, throws in not one, but two names for the paternity test, making this family drama a real whodunit. He waited until a week before his 13th birthday to have a DNA test done at home. And my son comes home, being at his house for the weekend, and he said, Mom, my dad stuck a Q-tip in my mouth and said he was checking to see if I had any diseases. Whoa. Tell me about that day. You were visiting the man you believed to be your biological father. The dude that's supposed to be my dad signed my birth certificate. He pretty much was all on a roll like, yeah, we're just checking to see if he had any diseases. What's going on? He's just checking to see if he had any diseases. So later on that day, I ended up going home with him and then I ended up going home to my mom after he dropped me off. And so, Ms. Johnson, you remember that day. Mm -hmm. And at some point, did you get the results? Yes, and it came back that he wasn't his. Oh. And then he just stopped talking to me. He just, like, left me, just no dad. <laughs> so, Ms. Johnson, that's what leads you to now believe Mr. Ellerson is Damien's biological father. Yes. Because the other two gentlemen who you thought were are not possibilities. Right. 
In a plot twist fit for daytime TV, another guy jumps in with a secret DNA test, mixing up the story and adding himself to the maybe daddy's list. This new twist sends the dad mystery into chaos, more tangled than a bowl of noodles. Um, she told me that they, she was deeply in love with him, you know, like sexually and of course all that when around the time I was born, you know, 96. So there is, it could be a possibility, but we never really figured it out because, you know, he's deceased. My mom shows me pictures and everything. I, I do look like him, you know, and it's out of all the dudes she does show me, it's he is the one that I do look like. So when you look at the picture, you feel like you see a resemblance. Did you meet his family? I met him once when I was thir 12 or 13. Ms. Johnson, you know, gave her pictures and stuff and that he might be my brother's son. So in a way, my mom believed it, kinda, but it was just too emotional. As far as me, kinda, but I don't think so. The courtroom turns into a wild ride of emotions as family and possible dads testify, each adding their own spice to this complicated relationship soup. The air's thick with drama, hopes, and fears as everyone adds their bit to the dad hunt, making it an epic search for truth and where you belong. Ms. Johnson, not only that, you slept with two of my cousins. I slept with one. Two. One. Two. Oh, so are you testifying that you believe your cousin, not your brother, could be Damien's biological father? Yes. Ms. Johnson, you did sleep with Mr. Ellerson's cousin? Yes, I did. Well, that cousin is here, and I think we need to hear from him. Jerome, you're Mr. Ellerson's cousin. I am. Also had a sexual relationship with Ms. Johnson. I did. Your cousin, Miss Fortune, said that she believes you could, in fact, be Damien's biological father. What do you say to that? I mean, myself, I don't believe I am, but, I mean, there's always a possibility. Why don't you believe you are? Do you admit having a sexual relationship with Ms. Johnson? Yes, I do. Was the sex protected? No, it wasn't. And since being told that Mr. Henley could potentially be your biological father, have you tried to develop a relationship at all with him? I have not, but at this time, it would be nice to know who my dad is. You know, everybody else got their dad. Everybody else growing up had their dad there. I don't, you know? So it'd be nice to be able to call somebody dad, you know? My mom, growing up, my mom's been my dad, so, and I've been my own dad, so, you know, it'd be nice. It's, it's rough, but that's why we're here today, figure it out.